Good morning and uh, welcome to 58VE. We're delighted to be hosting uh, this event here this morning. Um, just want to say massive thank you to, to Hirespace for, for choosing us for, for this event, um, as well as big thank you to Harbour & Jones for all the fantastic food. I'm sure hopefully you've all got to enjoy it and you may get to enjoy a bit more afterwards as well. Um, big thank you to Aztec as well, who are our AV supplier here this morning. Um, and just quickly to say, we've got this fantastic space down here, but also up on level six, we've got a, we've got a, a stunning balcony and terrace and some smaller meeting rooms, which boast amazing views across London skyline. So we're going to run some uh, site visits at the end at 10.30, and it'd be fantastic if you've got five minutes. I know you're all very busy, but it literally will take five minutes just to whiz you upstairs and, and, and show you what, what you could book as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoy the session and thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Charlotte Sanctuary, and I'd like to introduce you to Louise um, Gerlin in the middle here, Gareth Dimelo and Dominic Titchener Barrett. If you could just say a few words about each of yourselves, and then we can crack on. Great. Um, I'm Gareth Dimelo. I'm a founder and creative strategist of Lifted, and my background is in uh, strategic communications and uh, comms planning, and yeah, that's me. Uh, Louise Golan, so I'm in my second year of chair of the HBA. If you're not sure what the HBA is, we're the Hospitality, ho sorry, Hotel Booking Agents Association, which is a partnership of venues and 83, I think there's 84 agency members now in our association. So that's my voluntary job. My other job is I'm head of venues at Top Banana as well. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dominic uh, Titchener I'm CEO of DTB Sports Hospitality and Event Management. Um, in addition to running DTB, I also double up as a sponsorship advisor, consultant, and uh, part-time sports agent. Thank you very much. Um, I think, well, as the main question is how to capture your audience while remaining compliant, friendly, and corporate entertaining. Um, I think one of the key things that we've been chatting about this morning is the objectives of starting, whether it's a seminar, meeting, event, hospitality. Um, and Gareth, perhaps you can give your thoughts about how important it is to be able to get a really valuable event success by thinking about the beginning part of it. Absolutely. I, I think um, one of the things I've observed in the last sort of 10 to 15 years is events as, a, as an entity has started to grow up and has started to think far more strategically about why it exists and why its events and experiences exist. And I think uh, looking at how to capture the audience is the real part of the question there that, that really resonates because it's about how do we ensure that the experiences we create are going to deliver the um, emotional triggers, the behavior changes, the knowledge capture that our attendees actually want to get out of the events that they attend because they're not just there because they've got nothing better to do. They're there because they want to go on a transformational journey and it's our responsibility um, as event planners, managers, deliverers to make sure that we answer those needs. So spending some time not just thinking about the company on whose behalf we're creating the experience, but also the people we expect to come, what transformational journey do we want to take them on? I think once you factor that into the planning process, you can make sure that it's a much more effective event. And by effective, that can be, it can be entertaining, it can be memorable, it can be shocking, it can be surprising, it can be all of those things. But being really clear with your objectives up front is how you ensure all of that happens. And Dominic, do you feel the same thing about the hospitality industry? I mean, obviously, it's now much more diverse than it ever used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so knowing your clients well and thinking about what they want to achieve, is that the same in hospitality? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give everyone an example, really, sort of when I sort of first set my business up in um, 2002, was it was very much CEO or senior management driven. Um, so the event manager wasn't as included in the process of of thinking and understanding. Things have had to change because obviously it's much more, as you've said, um, the workforce is much more uh, gender inclusive, um, diverse, much more representative. So therefore, um, it's not so much just because the CEO likes cricket, therefore they would, they would invest in, in sponsoring something at Lords or the Test Match Series. There's a lot more in-depth thinking that goes on behind creating an event. Um, and actually event managers are being allowed to really have an implement, a real input into that process, which arguably with many organisations they weren't before. Um, and it would just be like, we're going to do the football and we'll, take, we'll go off to watch Chelsea, for example, without necessarily even thinking, and this is how 
uh, perhaps where the female and the male brain differ, <laughs> that actually the particular client couldn't stand Chelsea because they were a Manchester United fan. It was as rudimentary as that in terms of um, how events are. So things have definitely changed. In, uh, I've had many experiences. Yeah. 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 Doesn't want to come to the rugby. Have you thought he might not like rugby? <laughs> Louise, any thoughts on, on, from you on this? Um, yeah, I th it, is the, it is the purpose of event, and it's how you create those memorable experiences. But it's not just the memorable experiences. It's actually personalising it to some extent to everybody within the audience. Um, so they do actually take away those key takeaways. And the return on engagement and investment is there, and it's a measurable output. So, again, personalisation is, is a big thing now when, you, when you're coming to develop events of any of anything and by personalization i just don't mean um a nice note in their car in in their room or or anything like that it, it's it's actually it's it's more emotional um for for all the the de delegates involved in in the event itself and i think i think on that there's a there's a challenge for us all whereby audiences want personalization everything we do now is personalized from Netflix having its algorithms that monitor what we watch and making recommendations based on things that we think we like to, you know, me reeling off the 15 different components of the coffee that I want in Starbucks. We live in a world where personalization defines every experience that we have. But here's the challenge. Delegates don't want to tell us exactly what they want. They want to see some kind of sign that we know. So we have to be smarter at understanding them and their world and the kind of things they like without standing with a clipboard going, we'd just like to create the exact event experience that you want because that feels like we're cheating. It feels like we're, don't ask me what I want. Tell me yeah. that you understand me and you know what I want and you've created an experience based on your understanding of me. Show me that you care. Show me that you've actually mm. taken some time to get to know me. And there are ways of doing that which allow you to create a more personalised experience for the delegate. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I mean, in a nutshell, it's it's client-led. It's a two-way process now, so that the client wants to wants to be heard and listened to. Um, at the same time, obviously, companies are now being forced to actually go out and really get to know the client, especially obviously with compliance and procurement issues with the bribery act and everything else that complicates things further. Um, but Gareth's right. Yeah, people do want to 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 uh, to, to have a two-way dialogue. Um, one thing I did forget. Please do ask a question whenever you want to. Just. You know, we wanted this to be more as interactive as possible, so um, please do. You brought us very kindly up into the compliance and procurement, um, which we all have um, issues for. And I know that you have some thoughts on, well, both Anne and you, Gareth, have some thoughts on compliance, that big word, but actually it means many different things. Yeah, I mean, uh, for those that work within the financial sector, um, especially since uh, 2008, it's become obviously... Um, the waters have come somewhat muddied, and obviously since the inception of the, the, the July, uh, bribery act, July 2011, I think I suppose I'm not a I'm not a big advocate to 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 to, to, to say that. I suppose the, the big problem at the moment is there's a huge amount of confusion. There's a lot of big corporate companies that have an army of people who work in compliance, procurement, sales, etc., etc. And the big problem at the moment is that they don't communicate. The big one of the big problems with big corporate companies they don't communicate clearly and effectively. So I'm just going to read you something that uh, we got uh, Justice Ken Clark when I was working with the Department of Culture, Media and Sports to come out with. And what he said was that bona fide hospitality promotion or otherwise business expenditure, which seeks to improve the image of a commercial organization, better present products and services or establish cordial relations, is recognized as an established and important part of doing business in the UK as it is not the intention of the Act to criminalize such behavior. I think this has been very much lost on the next generation of event managers where so, so often I hear from, from um, y younger uh, event managers, oh, we can't do that because of the Bribery Act. And if I ask them what the Bribery Act is, to the letter, 95% of them don't really fully understand what the key five tenets of the Bribery Act are. And obviously, as you guys probably know, this, this notion of reasonable and proportionate is... is in my opinion, frankly, uh, about as useful as Nostradamus' uh, you know, predictions. Um, so it's, it's, it's muddied the waters um, by virtue of the fact that if you look at Twickenham, if you look at Royal Ascot, if you look at the quintessentially English or British sporting events, they're sold out 20 to 30 times over. If you look at the demographic who's there, it's, it's all the usual suspects and, 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 a, many, and a, a much bigger generation of younger, 
IT professionals, gaming, and so on and so forth. So I think the bribery act's become this big, scary, this scary, scary act and word, and it's really not. It's just about making sure that one has a full understanding of what it is that you can do and what you can't do. And clearly, there were some aspects of behavioral um, behaviors within certain corporate clients, both here and abroad, that, that had to change, that were perhaps borderline um, unscrupulous and, at worst, damn right, you know, uh, dodgy. Um, that has changed. Uh, but unfortunately, we're still left with this sort of lack of confusion that exists within the marketplace. So hopefully, if, any, if anyone was, uh, would like further clarification, I actually wrote an article in July 2011, which you're welcome to come and see me after, if, should you want to learn more about the Bribery Act. And I'm sure you've all read the Bribery Act, haven't you? Yes, must like me. Yes. And your views? Because uh, I know you used to be in the pharmaceutical industry, yes, wasn't it? Yes, so and Very compliant. Yeah, it? so pharmaceutical compliance came out in what year 2000 I think it was where it, and it's just snowballed on from there and it was the UK that actually set that snowball on um, and it came in for a reason it really did come in for a reason within the pharmaceutical industry um, on how we were actually educating our healthcare professionals and supporting them in their everyday life um, so I the I gr I've grown up, grown up with this compliance coming in. You know, the, 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 um, the events that we used to host for healthcare professionals were just out of this world, honestly, out of this world. So to bring it back round, I think compliance has been a good thing. Um, and it's how you incorporate that compliance, that procurement thinking into your everyday life as an event planner to make sure that you are working to your best ability and creating those memorable experiences because you can still do it within the parameters that are set by compliance and procurement. So in my opinion, I think it is a good thing and it actually gives people boundaries and parameters to work within. Yeah, I, I see compliance as uh, it's very easy for it to just become another bogeyman. It's another thing for us to be afraid of. It's another thing that's here to inhibit our creativity, inhibit our opportunities to do good work. I think that's a bit of a cop-out, to be honest. Um, we had the same conversations 10 years ago when procurement started getting more involved. And again, I think much of that was associated with you know, financial transparency and ethics in business and all of those issues. Procurement wanted to make sure that companies were spending their money on the right stuff, and suddenly they were involved in the decision-making process, evaluating creative proposals, event concepts that they didn't understand. And I think um, Dominic made the point earlier about there not being enough communication between big organizations. And I, I'd like that to be spray-painted in neon on the wall, because that is the rule that we all need to observe. Big companies don't communicate. And so what happens is you've got the compliance experts or the procurement experts who don't understand the event concepts, the marketing objectives that we're looking to deliver against. Likewise, you've got the event professionals who don't know the ins and outs of procurement and compliance. So you've got these important divisions within businesses who simply don't understand each other's world and they see each other as the enemy. And that's really nonsense. I think everyone should just have a big group hug and get to know each other a little bit better because Pollyanna view of the world aside, the point is better understanding leads to better results. So the more we understand it and don't see compliance as something that's just there waiting to go, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. We recognize that compliance is a thing to make sure that as businesses we do the right thing. So knowing that we're all on the same journey to do the right thing, what is a good thing? What does good look like? Not what can't we do, what can we yes. do? What should we do? Come up with a solution about how to not bend the rules, but to understand the compliant rules yeah. Yeah. and use that to the advantage of both sides, the happiness of the compliance team yeah. and you know, the, the solution for the event, meeting, hospitality, whatever it might be, yeah. so that the, the, the customer, the client, um, you know, is a happy bunny. If I can give um, a, a sort of slightly um, odd analogy, Many years ago, I worked in a company that uh, specialised in internal communications and recruitment marketing. So, small print, we did job ads. And when the government brought in the new age discrimination, new, it was new 15 years ago, the age discrimination legislation, there was panic across the recruitment marketing industry because suddenly you weren't allowed to ask people how old they were mm. because it could inhibit their uh, success or viability as a candidate going for a job. 
So the whole industry was in panic because all of the bad habits it had learned over the years about you will have X number of years experience, you'll probably be at the start of your career a couple of years out of university. They were all actually bad practices, but we just got into the habit of doing them because it was the easy shortcut. And suddenly what we had to do was actually think, well, do I want a candidate who's got, let's say we're talking about years, three years of amazing experience and a fast track of progression, or someone who's done something for 20 years and actually has been coasting. The principle there was that the duration of time wasn't what mattered. It was the quality of the work that they'd done that mattered. And suddenly, the industry that was seeing this restriction on talking about years, because it played directly to the age discrimination legislation, suddenly it had to start writing better communications rather than falling back on those old habits where, well, if we say three to five years, we know that they're in their mid-twenties. So you can't do that anymore. And it made the communications better. Do we have anybody from compliance procurement? No. Nobody. <laughs> we can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if there was anybody who could have shared their own thoughts from that point of view rather than from all of us who are sort of... Or, or, or is anyone uh, that are, is actually an event manager that's come across a compliance uh, issue or problem in the last three years? Gosh, you're very lucky. Yes, you have. You have. I believe they came in on third, third of Jan. Is that right? On the yeah. Mm. I want to understand a bit more about that. Dominic. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'll be honest with you, I have a, have a, have a, have a, fairly, I have a fairly rudimentary understanding of, of MIFID 2 because I haven't uh, studied it and, um, to, to the level that I perhaps arguably I should have done. Um, from an investment banking point of view, which is I think the financial sector we're talking about, um, in a nutshell, it has added yet another layer of uh, bureaucracy. Um, so, for example, when I'm entertained by, on behalf of HSBC or any of these other banks and stuff like that, um, the fundamental issue there is that they want to know uh, my name, my details. So the client needs to know everything about me, proof of that you know I'm not involved in money laundering and everything else. So all it all it all it does is that for someone like me that has to be fairly transparent because I'm in the public eye, it's not a problem. For someone perhaps that's an overseas ultra high net worth individual, particularly if they're not British and they don't want their details or their home address and everything else, you're, you're fine. What I'm finding, and particularly within the private wealth management sector at the moment, is, is if, if they're particularly if they've got dubious dealings, as, a, as many of these individuals do, they're just not interested. They won't accept the invitation. They won't provide that information. So that's where it's complicated the relationship with the private wealth manager um, or, or someone that works with ultra high net worth individuals. And from a financial, from the big four professional, I mean, this is just becoming more. People want to, anybody wants to know how much a ticket has cost, how much the day is, who else is going, who's hosting. It's just becoming much more individual, but not in the right way. Um, everybody's just questioning it all the time. I mean, as we tried to talk before, everything's got to be very personalised. Now you've got to think about whether it's rugby, tennis, London Fashion Week, whatever it might be, but um, not to the extent that you're putting off people by asking yeah. them far too many questions. I mean, the two key questions within, within that MIFID two legislation are, um, how long have you known this client? And second question is, how do you expect to potentially benefit from this activity? Um, and again, those are sort of, again, two questions that, um, the first one is fairly easy to, to explain without uh, needing further clarification. The second one, um, particularly obviously, which is an extension of the bribery act is, are you trying to entertain in order for that, that particular client to do to win the business, or are you entertaining after the deal has been done? So, I suppose as a thank you, uh, yeah, it could be taken I mean, a different way. I, I, I'm not here to help circumnavigate the, <laughs> the legislation, Hello. but clearly the way in which a lot of companies get around that, or or, or, or how I would suggest they get around it, <laughs> is that obviously the entertainment is done after the conclusion of the deal, so there cannot be any um, accusation from. SFO or various other financial regulatory bodies of saying, well, you, you, you won that deal because you took them to the men's final of Wimbledon, for example, or you know, the FA Cup final. But then the other argument is you, from a wider group is you've got to get to know your clients, so you've got to build a relationship before you're actually going to win any work, which I suspect is a lot of the reasons why you're all doing the different types of events you're doing. 
Um, so it is, it's, it's very murky in the middle. I mean, it's but I think what's fascinating about coming from outside of that, not dealing with you know, issues of specific compliance, that principle of asking yourself what you want to get out of inviting somebody to an event, that's good practice. Knowing why you're doing something, yes. knowing why yes. you're inviting somebody to an event. You know, I've always used uh, simple um, strategic planning tools. Like um, in my last agency, we had a simple one that where we had to ask ourselves, what do we want delegates to feel, think, know, and do as a consequence of attending our event? Well, knowing why you're inviting someone, why you're wanting to spend some time at, at whatever kind of event or experience yes, you're delivering, that's almost by the by. The point is, you're inviting them to spend some time with your brand, whether they're a, an end-of-the-line consumer or whether they're a big corporate client. The fact is you're spending time with them because you want to deepen that relationship. Mm -hmm. You want to understand them more and you want them to understand you more because that's where more fruitful business relationships come from. That's a standard principle. So even that, you can see it as it is restricted bureaucracy. And let's face it, we're a world with an abundance of bureaucracy and it's painful. But sometimes the intent behind the bureaucracy is a good thing if you can just separate the paperwork, the red tape, from the intent. Yes. The intent is a good thing. And I think the more you learn to embrace the intent, the more effectively you can work. Yeah, and I think one of the, one of the advantages if, if, um, of, of what, what this has forced people to do, is, as, as Gareth just uh, initiated, is that, you know, for example, for us, our reaction to, to the Road Back to 2008 was to broaden the offering. So in 2008, we set up a music, theatre, and arts division um, to cater for um, you know, music, gigs, tours, festivals, Harry, you know, Harry Potter, learning to skate on ice with all the Walt Disney characters. So it enabled us actually to reach out to a far greater audience because obviously if the rugby was then becoming prohibitively expensive as it will become um, this November at £1,345 plus VAT per person, you can then actually really reach out to find a much uh, more diverse portfolio, which perhaps is actually much more suitable uh, to your client in any case, because actually he's got a, a, a love of arts, or it's a slightly younger audience, and they actually want to go and have a VIP experience at Glastonbury or any of the big music festivals that we've got. So it's actually, in a sense, actually really, really opened up the floor to a, a far greater diversity of, of, of events, and it doesn't have to just be sport, 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 sport. And do many people here do hospitality, or is it mostly meetings and seminars? Hospitality, nodding over there. Good. Do you find it, it more restrictive nowadays? Or? It depends what we do, but yeah, it's like we're in the financial industry, so a lot of people we do do have like a level that they, they often ask how much you know, that the event that they're coming to or what we're putting on for them costs and whether then they have to let us know whether they can attend or not. Mm. So we do have to consider that, obviously, yeah. Yes. And, it, and if, I don't, if you don't mind, you don't have to say, but what, what is that limit that you, as your particular institution, have put? What is that cap that you've put in, in place? We don't really have a cap. We try to right. stick around the um, 200, 50, 300 pounds right. is what people tend to be comfortable with. Mm. Okay. Um, any more than that, I think there are sort of questions asked about yeah. it. Sure. So sure. I don't know if we've ever had someone say they can't come to anything. No, but, they just... <laughs> yeah. But we rule out a lot of events just like Ascot <laughs> yeah. and Wimbledon purely because yes. of the price yeah. of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, tech. How is technology affecting all of our uh, measuring and um, helpfulness of events? Gareth, do you want to start on this one? I, yeah, because it's a bit of a... A bugbear of mine. I've been participating in panel discussions and doing presentations and workshops about technology and social media for probably the last five or six years. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I usually know around November I'll have people from the industry magazines getting in touch going, what are the big tech trends of next year? And I've, I've stopped responding to them now because... What usually happens is when I read the article, when it goes up on like the 2nd of January, you know, the big tech trends of 2018, I've had, tried doing this, go back and Google tech trends of 2017 and 2016 and 2015, and I promise you, they're all saying the same thing. They'll say, facial recognition is going to be big, you know, personalized itineraries, um, event apps are going to be huge still, um, augmented reality and virtual reality is huge, adding another layer to the experience is literally the same thing people have been saying for five years. 
which is the long way around to say it's not that different. The fact is, technology can do a bunch of different things. It can streamline your registration and management services, in which case it's adding real bottom line value to how you run your event, and they're great. And my advice to those companies is be clear on your differentiator, because I've sat through enough presentations with the people who run these kind of software solutions, and what they're not able to do is clearly delineate their offering from their competitors. And that's a challenge for people buying those services, because they're not trained in technology, they're not from a tech buying background, so they're going to go with what's the value that you're going to bring, rather than just what's the unit cost. The second thing is, you can use technology to distract from the actual experience, and I know Dominic shared his point of view about his frustration as a music fan and a sports fan, the people who live their experience through their smartphone. So that's fine, and there's a generational divide uh, that some of us look at people doing that, and we're like, would you not just want to get lost in the moment? Mm. But actually, there's a generation of people now who aren't having an experience unless they are sharing it with their cultivated network. It's just the way of the world now, and technology can sometimes enhance the way they do that. So what you're going back to looking at the cost versus the value of attending an event or an experience, giving them the chance to do the thing that they love the most is a great technology mm. investment because you can create the kind of experience that they want to have. And then thirdly, there's the gimmicks. There's the stuff that you put in. And I find a lot of clients that I've worked with over the last 10 years are given a mandate from someone higher up going, we want some cool new tech, some cool stuff, something that's never been done before at our event, and as I said to Charlotte earlier, the reason it's never been done before is because it doesn't work. And you do not want to spend your money on something that doesn't work, because at the end of the day, you'll have to justify why that money was spent on this gizmo. thing. Gizmo. gizmo. And it is, it's a gizmo, it's, it's a gimmick. I mean, uh, we've, you know, we've also seen, I mean, moving away from the technological side in terms of how Technology has been incorporated in sport. With you know, Hawkeye's been around for years and years with the cricket and obviously Wimbledon. That's a very positive use of technology intervention in the actual live sporting process. It's very quick. You get a decision, and before you know it, you made a decision. What hasn't necessarily worked is I was at uh, Twickenham uh, last Saturday, and the Welsh had a, a, a disallowed try, which I don't think it was a try personally. Um, world Rugby, of course I'm biased. <laughs> uh, obviously World Rugby said there was a mistake was made. Um, and that took probably about five minutes. We in the crowd were getting a bit restless. Then there was sort of like, you know, a lot of Anglo-Welsh banter. And then it started to get a bit nasty <laughs> and, and everything else. And, and we're also seeing it, for example, with VAR in the Premiership. You know, with Alan Shearer being very vocal about it the day when there was a... a um, I forget to recall the game, but there was a disallowed goal. It was an allowed goal. So, and it's just where the sporting experience... You've gone there, and then you're waiting, I think, six or seven minutes for this, this guy to make a decision. Was it a goal? Was it wasn't a goal? So you've got two very good examples of where Hawkeye's been fantastic for, um, for tennis. It's been very successful for cricket, but it does slightly undermine the integrity of the umpire. And then opposing fans, that, and it causes a little bit of a divide, particularly with sort of more um, antagonistic sort of rivalries between, let's say, for example, Australia and England in the cricket, or England versus Pakistan in, the, in, in their test series. So it's an interesting way of where technology has been brought in to enhance the uh, event experience. But also, I think at the moment, it's, it's far from perfect, and it can actually ruin the experience, particularly if you then leave with Manchester United having lost to Liverpool on a contentious issue, whereas if we go back to 1966 when Jeff Hurst scored the, the winner, uh, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of part of the history of it, that's the big debating point between German fans and, and, and English fans, isn't it? And it's, I'm not sure necessarily that, that just having technology for technology's sake within sport necessarily enhances the consumer experience. And I can say that very much for events as well. There's no point in creating an event app if you're not going to use it. Um, event apps have so much capability of really, really personalising and bringing an event to life. But if you don't use it properly, it's a complete waste of time for everybody. And it's actually a distractor to the event itself. And people will just leave completely disheartened. From, a, so from technology in general in the events industry, I think event managers and, and event creators actually need to understand what technology is out there at the moment, how to use it, and how to really create those memorable experiences because 
there is a lot out there that is just going, nobody pays any attention to it whatsoever. Um, and it could be from your big budget productions or even to your small budgets. You know, there, there is something for everybody out there. And it's, it's that research, but it's trying to understand how to use the technology to really enhance an event, not for just saying, oh, look, we've got 3D in here today. If, if it's no purpose, don't use it. It goes back to the, the court right at the beginning, which is what is your objective? Because yeah. yes. if you're not going to use it properly, Absolutely. what is the point of having it? And there's, you know, yeah. there's a perfect example. It's not, technology is not just buying in kit and putting it in a corner of the room and going, look, we've got some cool new kit. Isn't that amazing? Because people go, yeah, I saw that last week. It yeah. doesn't really transform it. Technology is also about recognizing the solutions that we already have in our day-to-day -day lives that make us more connected. They help us understand each other better. So social media is a great example. Um, and again, in my last agency, we worked on a, on a very large annual uh, technology conference. And over the years, we were able to use social media not only to engage with people before, during, and after the event. We were able to poll their opinion on kind of little nuanced elements of the hospitality experiences that we want to create. You know, did they want Prosecco or beers at the after party? What kind of music were they really into? Would they like rock band or salsa? It was all of that sort of stuff. But what we also did was we were able to use the social media profiles of our followers, as in the people who were very publicly declaring their intent to attend our event. We were able to look at their social media profiles and learn about them. So back to that earlier point I made about not interrupting the experience with a clipboard, we were actually able to study them because we all, as a species, make our profiles public, or as public as we want them to be. So as much as we want to share with the world about our interests, whether we're into rugby or cricket or football or rock music or the arts or cinema, our profile is there to see. That information is there. And to me, the value of technology in events is things like that, is knowing where we can find the people that we want to attend our events and just finding more out about them because they're putting that information out into the universe. It's All you need to do is spend a little bit of time at a laptop and just read up on it. You can find out everything you need to know. And then when the attendee comes to the event or the experience, they're like, this feels like it was made for me. How did you get and, inside my head? And that is, that it, it, it just goes back to that events do not fit everybody. You know, we all, as your point, we're all individual. We all want to know, I don't know, You've spent time looking after me and asking me to my to the ballet or to the rugby mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, um, and not just use it and then disregard it. Because if you looked at somebody and they were a member of the RFU, yeah. why would you invite them to football? Mm. Yeah, the other interesting thing is, um, from a sort of more of a, a ticking point of view, is that with, I'm, I'm seeing particularly the sort of an older generation that is very anti e-commerce e, e or e-tickets, so that you actually find that even the younger generation where actually they physically want to touch, feel, and dare I say it, smell a ticket, as opposed to, you know, have it on their iPhone. And, of course, obviously, uh, at various venues, um, there is obviously notable problems with the, when the scanning device doesn't work and the battery dies. And there's all sorts of complications that, that go with that because, obviously, the technology is there probably for every governing body if they so wanted to, to roll out e-tickets. But there's actually sort of almost a reluctance there to, to change that because, at the moment, I think the, you know, people just like to have a physical ticket that they, that, that they like to hold, you know, and then now keep as a memento and put into wall charts as a sort of a, a memento of their experiences over the last, you know, 10 years or so, so. I think Dominic makes a really important point there that sometimes there's an assumption because technology exists, we have to put it in. Yeah. Um, and really, yes. sometimes the opposite is the case. I was, I was speaking at a, an event about 18 months ago and someone asked that we were talking about um, social media being a fundamental part of designing and delivering the event experience. And someone asked the question, do you think we'll have an event where actually we can go as absolutely zero technology, uh, zero social media? And I said, whilst I can understand asking a reactionary question like that, like the world is zigging, so let's zag, if people want that as part of their experience, then we have a responsibility to deliver it. Conversely, if people say they actively don't want a digital ticket, they want a physical ticket because we understand the emotional resonance of having that souvenir, the same way that I can't go to a West End show without buying a programme. I don't need the programme, it's just a giant, <laughs> lovely printed booklet. But to me, that's part of the experience of going to the theatre, is taking away that big glossy brochure. It's understanding all of the 
um, emotional and behavioral triggers of a live experience and designing it to suit the needs of the audience rather than going either everybody likes social media or everybody hates social media and they want a really offline experience. It's, it's allowing that balance to reflect the needs and the interests of the audience. And can I ask, are you all under great pressure to provide the best techie, the newest machines, the newest event things all the time, or? No? So, I mean, us as a venue, we've got a, a 3D projector, we've got a smart glass wall, and the thing all our clients go nuts for is the fact they can write on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, 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 we tell them they can write on the walls. <laughs> We're all children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's really interesting, actually, that it's all there. And I think that a lot of people don't really understand what one can do with it and how to use all these very high-tech gizmos, yeah. I would call them. Did you want to ask a question? Sorry. Yeah, I think Sorry, well, the, the whole idea of, like, um, like corporate entertaining, obviously, you're talking about tech um, as, like, a new thing, and it can be, like, a fad or a gimmick. For the generation of people who have grown up with tech, obviously... The events world has had to adapt to tech. Um, for people growing up with tech, so like intrinsically part of their lives, mm -hmm. will we not see a kind of, yeah, like an, a natural adoption of tech as the next generation of um, event professionals, corporate companies are entertained as, as they're kind of, from what to what, though? How do you see that? From what, in your, you, you are one of that, that generation. So, yeah. from, from what currently that we've had, say, for the last 10 years to what you see in 10 years' time, for example? So, obviously, it, it can be seen the events industry as quite old school. You've got corporate entertaining, traditional, sort of taking people to football matches, sure. taking them to the theatre, etc. Yeah. As the new generation comes in, will they not want to be entertained in a way which, like, is integrated with tech, with integrated with new experiences and these, like, as, as said, gimmicks? I think the, the hypothetical reality you're describing there is already here. Because if we were to poll the actual numbers of attendees, there will be more people in your generation than older generations. So, so that's the first thing, is that desire is already there. I think the challenge, and it's something that we mentioned when we had a previous conversation, and I don't know the direct solution to it other than waiting for everybody to die, but <laughs> <laughs> there are... There are senior stakeholders and decision makers, both client side, corporate side, agency side, that retain that old school mentality because they've been doing it longer. And I, you know, I speak as a generation who's gone through that transition, has learned about that technology and embraced it. But I also recognise that there are old school decision makers who are like, I'm the older generation, that's not how we used to do it, so that's not going to happen. So until those people are either phased out or something else, <laughs> then the people making the decisions with the power and the voice to go, but actually, this is the re You can fight it, you can resist it, you can say it's not how we used to do it. That doesn't matter. The fact is, there is a, a way, a momentum of interest in that being the day-to-day -day reality. This is just the way we use technology now. Our social media profile is the way we define ourselves in a public forum. And so it's not about whether I want to be on or offline. My whole existence is online. And you just need to understand that and allow me to make the decision about how I dial that up mm. or down. So I, th I think the issue, is, so just to give you an example, a few years ago I worked with um, a big mobile phone company and we were planning their annual leadership conference and it was going to be something like 2,000 senior managers from all over the world flying into London for a four-day conference. And we said, well, obviously, the first thing we need to do is start planning out an event app so that they can speak to each other, so that they can weigh in with you know, questions and responses. They can take part in the debate. They can message each other during the event. And the client who was running the event said, oh, no, sorry, we can't do that. We're, we're taking everyone's phones off them at the start of the event. <laughs> I said, you're a phone company. Yes, well, we'll get the baskets out. And they'll put the phones in it and we'll take them away. And, and I said, but you're flying thousands of managers to London to do an event, and then you're not letting them. And the technology is not a distraction. The technology is how you facilitate thousands of people all speaking to each other at once. It's, that's the solution. And suddenly that was seen as the obstacle, the thing that we couldn't do, because old school decision makers said if people are on their phones they're not engaging with the conference actually that's not true at all no. provided you give them the right platforms to engage with the content and with each other and I, that to me was 
a kind of stark reminder that there is a generational divide in the people who make the decisions, not the people who are necessarily pushing and advocating for the integration of that technology. And can you see a big change coming up in the next 10 years? I mean, what, what industry, sorry, which part of the industry are you in? So I actually work for, for higher space. So I'm 24, right. for example. Um, but somebody who's 14 will use tech and will view tech and communication in a very different way to me. I'm actually quite anti-tech, like, I don't do much social media, I'm not that involved. But somebody who's 14 is very different. So when they enter the corporate domain and when they, yeah, eventually in a career, do you foresee it changing yet again? I think, I think it's, 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 it's constantly changing. I mean, um, there's probably two examples I can use in, in, in my, own, my own companies. Um, we, we brought in, I'm from the sort of play, uh, PlayStation, uh, Xbox generation. So... Uh, still play now, but anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, we, we brought in to uh, one of the marquees um, a, a, a Jonah Lomu's Rugby World Cup because we thought actually anyone below 14 below, um, most 40 year olds probably mature, I still haven't, so you'd actually think that they would actually go and play. You know what? They're far more interested in the guest speaker and being able to pass the rugby ball in order to exchange the business card than to play on any, any of these computer games. That's, that's one example. I think the other thing is that, you know, for example, uh, one of the big tournaments I, I'm involved with is the Aegon Tennis Championships. Um, and, you know, in, in the old days, you could go up and a customer service rep would go up and, and make a polite conversation with a view to getting the card or, or, or getting to sign up. Now, um, again, uh, we will go and sort of do, touch all the, all the, all the, all the, the lights in, it in order to have any, any engagement. So that's where probably technology is being utilised to sort of capture business cards and client data. So, um, and that's whilst obviously the tennis is all going around and that's been very good with the kids at, at Lords especially and everything else. So I think it will change. How, how it, I've given up trying to second guess how it's constantly changing because like Gareth said, if you'd asked me 10 years ago when I... Uh, whatever that was, 2010, whether uh, there would still be physical tickets, I probably would have given Gareth the answer that actually, no, I can see everything being electronic tickets. That hasn't happened. And, and similar to you being anti-tech or anti-social media, that there's even um, the, your generation and above that is actually just, you know what, we just, want to, we, just, we just don't want that unless it provides a positive enhancement to the experience. And I, I'm not anti-tech. I think where, 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 there's, where there's a positive enhancement to the event, by all means, let's use it. But I think where there's a reaction is, is using technology for technology's sake, mm. just because it's a fad, as Gareth alluded to earlier, I think that's, that's, that's the problem I have with it. Um, because then, you know, I'll give you an example. I was lucky to be at the Joshua um, Puliev fight in Cardiff. And, you know, I'm in row three, so I'm probably about as close to, 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 to where you are, to the ring. And yet the rows one and two are constantly getting up with the phone and watching it through the phone. And it's just absolutely madness when you, when you think about it, that you're actually live at an event, and yet you're stopping your your emotional experience to get up and film it when, I mean, I don't know what the, the, the footage is like on these phones, but I'm sure it's not as good as uh, Sky Sports HD. <laughs> or actually being there live in, 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 in the moment. So that's the problem I have with it, really. Is it's this and will we have... That, that, sorry, sorry. 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 That, okay. that, what that does is that says there's an opportunity here to understand the audience better, which for some people, we deliver the experiences, so we think the experience is the most important thing, which is only to be expected. But for somebody else, bragging rights of being there and being able to transmit the proof that they were there is as important as the experience itself. Mm. Which brings we, you back to your hard tickets that yeah, were programme, saying, yeah. I was there. Yeah, yeah. We, we can debate about whether it's right or wrong. It feels counterintuitive. But if that's somebody's primary emotional driver, is the bragging rights of being there, then all we simply have to do is provide them with the opportunity to deliver on the kind of experience they want, which is you can have the bragging rights section over there and the people who actually give a shit about what's happening yeah, over here. My, my point is I would have got a better view by staying at home watching it on Sky that's, rather than having someone so in front of me yeah. with a... <laughs> 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 But maybe we'll have meetings in years to come where people actually won't all get together in one room. Mm -hmm. They'll just be calling in and looking at the bits of the content that they want to, um, you know, to want to listen to. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, I think that already happens. I, I mean, I think um, in terms of meetings and events, um, I think people, um, as human beings, we have an innate desire to connect with other people anyway, uh, and not just online, obviously, but face to face. And I think. Uh, I've worked on lots of events whereby you, you've still got a full house, but your audience is massively um, grown by then pushing that content out, yeah. a bit live or after. So I think that happens anyway. Do we think the 14-year-olds will 
also want to be physically there? I think... In 10 years? I, I, yeah, I think there's something... Uh, there, I, the years ago, there was this whole idea about hybrid events and all that. Well, that, that, I mean, that never yeah. really happened. I think it's, <laughs> it's all about the experience. Um, yeah. I think those who are heavily into their tech... Uh, and, the, and the younger generations, I think they'll be just a lot more picky. Do I really want to spend my time mm. going to this event and have an experience that's going to be nourishing, memorable and all of that? Which, which means you've got to be personal about the invitation, yeah. the content. It's got to be what you yeah. as an individual want. Yeah. And yeah. I think the one point there that I just challenge ever so slightly is young people aren't into tech. Young people are more into the things they're into because tech makes it possible for them to be into them. And it's, but it's a very important distinction to make because we sometimes assume that the gadget in the hand is what matters. It really isn't. It's the connection that they make through the gadget to the thing that they really yeah. care about. I think, I think, it, I think it, it, to a point, uh, there was some stat the other day that there's some incredible percentage of, of younger people, I guess, well, they're centennials or whatever. I mean, the, forget the labels, but that um, would be happy only ever having an online relationship. So it has to be through a gadget. So there are there are a lot of people who literally try and live their lives through a gadget, mm -hmm. but then they still want to have friends. But that, that, I mean, that was talking about a romantic relationship. I mean, how you have that through a phone, I don't know. But um, but Where there are of the future. I mean, <laughs> but there are there are a lot. I mean, it, people who are you know, my daughter, she's she's three. She can use an iPad better than I can. So there are those Already? who yeah yeah yeah. I mean, she loves it. Um, well. <laughs> It, but it's just it's just the way the, the way it is. The, the, it, it's much more natural for them. So, um, but still, I think connection and, and physical connection is is still always gonna gonna win over. But the experience that people come and get, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, you know as everyone said, tech for tech's sake. Why why would you do that? Mm -hmm. um, but whether there is tech or isn't tech, I think just depends on the experience you're trying to yeah. to offer people. I agree. But I think what one area where I think we as a species have evolved is we are better at doing more than one thing at once. It used to be when we watched a movie or watched a TV show, we sat and we watched the movie. Now I could be watching a movie and tweeting about it. I could be watching a live TV show and writing a blog about it and having a conversation with other people in the room at the same time. We're better at doing more than one thing. And I think... In the late 80s, early 90s, it was mischaracterized as the short attention span of the MTV generation. And I think it was just like, we can only pay attention to something for 15 seconds at a time. It's not true. We're just better at doing more than one thing. Older generations focused on one thing, and that was the thing. You couldn't read a book and watch a movie. You had to choose. Now we can do everything at once. And I think being at an event means that you can be watching content, listening to a conversation, tweeting about it, disagreeing with it, hashtagging it, putting a photo on Instagram. What we're all doing is we're getting better at aggregating and collating and curating the experience that we have and sharing it with our audience as well because we're all yeah. influencers to a greater or lesser degree. And, and I, I, th I think the one thing I try not to do is make any broad generalizations about any one group of people. And I think millennials is the perfect reason not to do that. Because if you look at millennials, it covers about an 18-year age range. And every country in the world, every religion, every culture, every ethnicity, every gender, and they're all lumped in as millennials. And people make generalize, oh, well, millennials like this kind of an experience. But you just can't possibly generalize to that degree. I think what will change, I think what will change is the, the, maybe the structure and the format of an event. Like, um, more, you know, I think you'll see more and more user-generated user content in, in live as it happens. Yeah. So more of the, the unconference style setup that's you know, heavily promoted sort of within the tech industry and stuff like that. I think more and more, um, and, and we'll just, you know, like for example, the, 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 the current sort of standard trade show, that, I mean, yes, it works. But will it work in 10 years' time? Mm -hmm. I mean, to a point, yes. But I think we're just going to always constantly be looking at how we deliver things to be the most effective and, and offer that experience. You know? And I, I think that's where we'll have to look at, yeah. where, where we have to adapt, not and just the, take on tech for tech's sake. And also some of the, the standard old-fashioned conferences, you know, three people standing up at the top, presentation, film, talk, content, getting off. You know, that thing has to change because I think that the... The audience wants it to change, and it has to. It's just yeah. got to change, I think. And I think that we're, we're a long way down that road now as well. Mm, yeah. You know, and the statistics of <clears throat> your four walls being used in events is really going down, and how the unusual 
interesting venues have really taken off with a bang. So, and it's worrying statistics for standard big boxes venue, residential venues, is how they're going to adapt their product to keep it relevant for, for events of the future. Because they've got some big, big space that is now empty. Mm. Sorry, yes, got a question um, just there at the back. Just interested, so um, I work for an online dining experience platform and there's a lot of uh, the word experience is being thrown out there today. Um, I'd just quite like to get your thoughts and your opinions on a booking process of how, what you think the world is changing into from a tech perspective of online booking, whether it be a dining experience or a walking tour experience or something like that. Louise, that's... Well, it's easy, isn't it? It's convenient. It's there. It's... I love it. Absolutely love it. And everything in my life, I've got to do it online. But book anything online, I would do it. I just... Do you think there's a hesitation because you, it's something new that people don't always know what it is? So because you, can't, you can see it online, but it's a new experience that maybe hasn't been done before. So there might be a reservation in doing the booking straight away. No, I just... I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. so. I don't imagine that the online booking is the blocker. I think the story that you tell, the way you yeah. visualise or represent the experience that you're looking to deliver, or even withhold some of the information, so that there's a, a degree of surprise or delight in what you ultimately deliver, I think that's the challenge, rather than um, seeing the, the online portal where people make the bookings as being the, the inhibiting factor. Mm. I think it all comes down to great communication. Okay, thank yes, you so yes. much. I think a lot of the time I get the feel that there's a sort of a natural mistrust of, of technology. So <coughs> they'd much rather we take the responsibility for booking it in, confirming it in writing, so that should anything go wrong, they've got someone to pay. Yes. I, get, I definitely get that. From a personal point of view, um, and I'm talking about sort of for, for my own bookings that I would make in a personal capacity, I just prefer to be able to pick up and, and form a relationship with that manager so that if there's a problem on the day, if there, something needs to happen, an extra chair, an extra place, that they know who I am. So I suppose I'm quite old-fashioned in the sense that if I go to a restaurant in town, they know me, they're going to go out their extra way. I'm not just not another aid, another booking which has been done online because they're never going to form a relationship like that. But I appreciate that probably requires a little bit more effort. But personally, I just like to pick up the phone and, have, and communicate. Mm. Um, I, if it's convenient and it's, you know, there's, there isn't that customer service because... It's very much that, you know, how some companies literally just drive, like Uber. Can you try and get through to a customer service representative of Uber when things go wrong? Impossible. Uh, for me, that just pisses me off. Um, but that's me. Yeah, I don't I disagree with you there. Just, uh, online bookings do not detract from your experience at the restaurant. The manager is always there. If you've booked online, they will have your history. They know who you are. So they, you will ha you will still that that experience should always be exactly the same. Mm. It that channel of booking should not have any should not detract from anything. So to me, the learning there is about it's not the online booking, it's not the personal experience, it's the link between the two. Yeah. If you've got an online booking system, but you're not using it to let's look at the last five orders that that customer placed, or the last five times that person booked with us, so we understand what they're likely to. In the same way, an algorithm would go, well, we know that you will always order this pizza from this, yeah. you know, artisanal pizza place. So can we recommend that to shortcuts so you don't have to browse through the whole menu to choose the thing that our system tells us we know you like. It's, it's that, it's, yeah. it's knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm going to mention big data just for a second. The world is constantly, the more technology is integrated into everything we do, the more it's constantly aggregating more and more data, which is great because it just fills server banks somewhere. <laughs> but we're not doing anything with that information. If we take the time to go, okay, there are some patterns starting to emerge here. We can learn things about our customers. We can offer a more personalized experience. Mm. We can reference the mm. thing they told us last time or the, mm. the special change they asked to be made to the menu. Mm. So from the customer perspective, it's just this place knows me and mm. they care that I came But back. you're only going to get there, and where I disagree with you, is you're only going to get that by you know, making polite conversation, asking that person how they are, interacting with them. Personal interaction is always going to be the most, this is perhaps yeah. where, um, you may differ on, on technological issues, but personal interaction is always going to be the most powerful 
for them. And I, would, I personally would be, it would be a very sad day where the human uh, beings basically re re put technology or online booking systems above a personal relationship. So you know, they're always going to remember me by being uh, hopefully polite and charming, et cetera, et cetera, rather than, oh, this guy's made you know, 10 bookings because that person will, will change and the manager will change. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I think, um, and, 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 you know, everyone here has made a booking with uh, Top Table. I mean, that's how many times have you made an online reservation only to find that actually that table is either, you know, hasn't quite materialized. It's not 100% foolproof. So for me, it's probably it's just a natural mistrust of, of, of technology, you know, and, and I suppose forming the relationship, the personal relationship, a highly personalized relationship, just ensures that there is a problem. They're going to go out that extra way to look after you rather than just being another number. Because regardless of whether it's a, a foolproof system, you're still just another number. And we, KPMG, we started, uh, opened a building for clients and deliberately didn't go online booking. Deliberately went down the personal greeting and the personal booking and the telephone rather than to build up those relationships. Mm -hmm. And a few people kind of moaned, but um, it's been successful because there are now good relationships between clients and some of the staff on the team there. But I think this goes back to the, the question that we had earlier about will there be a future where people attend events remotely and there's God, that god-awful period where everyone was talking about hybrid events and they never really materialised because everyone realised it was just a horrible idea. Um, but the, the principle there is the desire will always be to be in a room with other people. It's the reason you guys are all here today and not just watching a live stream of this. It's because you wanted to be in the room, you wanted to meet each other, you wanted to have a conversation, you wanted to break bread, figuratively, not literally. Um, you wanted to do all those things that we as human beings enjoy doing. And what technology allows us to do is say, look, if you can't physically be there in the room, the next best thing is to at least be part of the conversation so you can dial into it remotely. But the point is, you will never be able to replicate or beat the value of people coming together. That's why we all exist. Just, just on that point, I'd love to ask a quick question if I may about kind of event measurement, how you measure the success of, event, uh, of an event. Dominic, you mentioned kind of increasingly it's a two-way street between the client and the events organizer. Um, oh, sorry. Does that, um, do, do, does, is, is the, the kind of onus for demonstrating and, and measuring the success of the event, is that more of a kind of joint enterprise now too? Um, and does the panel have any kind of tips on, on, on kind of how, how you measure the success of an event um, in, in kind of 2018 and, and beyond? So I think first of all you need to look at the objectives, the reason for the event. That is your very, very... Second, who are the audience and how are they? How do they actually want to respond? How, how are you going to measure it? Um, and there's so many different ways of actually doing this. Online surveys, very, very basic, but it's not all about that. Um, it's how... It's the measuring of the cascading of the message if it's a B2B event. How, like a sales force, how are they going to cascade? How are they going to improve? Um, and it's how you measure that throughout post-event to ensure that the messaging, that the experience has actually been cascaded to the whole of the business. So increase in profits, increase in so less customer complaints, all of these things have, you know, can be measured and can be taken back to that event if those were the specific objectives of that event. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think Louise is right. From from a from a client point of view, it's it's simply ROI. It's it's literally returning on investment. Um, using my own example of when I take my top clients out to, to Queens, it's not just purely about um, a return of investment. It's actually about whether I've actually deepened that relationship with that particular um, director or events manager. Um, there's a number of tangibles that you can uh, sort of measure the, the relationship on and you know that would be for example an event manager that works at Coca-Cola or Tesco's would then refer me to a, perhaps a competitor or her friends or colleagues work um, at other institutions I wouldn't necessarily get into so that you, you measure it through through the how 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 willing that uh, client is prepared to, to help you grow your business and organic again is by far and away the most powerful way to grow your business still regardless of all these online platforms and search engines um, but if you, as Louis says, if you, you look most, I don't know which kind of systems you use. We use Microsoft Dynamics CRM. I know a lot of the guys that are a bit more sales-driven use Salesforce. You know, you've got very deep, rich analytical data in terms of the, the, the number of the amount of spend, the number of events they do, and it's it's really actually not not that that 
uh, complex really it's at the end of the day you take someone to an event and then you measure out as to what the return of of, of, of that relationship is either through through spend or through or, or through if they're if they're being um, helping you grow your business most of it's about building the relationship yes. to get that future business that referral that getting to know them better I mean that's the purpose of most of these events the challenge is those metrics are harder to prove Very. because if you're ultimately shifting perception if you're deepening a relationship what's the output of that this is it might be years it, yeah, could, it, be it, years. Could, it could be it could be and and unfortunately you're being tasked with proving the effectiveness of your event year on year but it might take you know you look at some of the big corporate relationships they might take three years of negotiating back and forth so how do you quantify the impact that your event or your live experience had on translating that ultimately into what became a contract or a sale or a business relationship it's not so easy to do, which is why we spend a lot more time um, thinking about how we track perception. And funnily enough, social media, I'll mention it again, is a really effective way of doing that, is looking at the conversations that are initiated about your brand or about your experience. You provide people with a hashtag. This is rather handily provided just here, <laughs> so I can banner white it. There you go. Um, you provide people with a hashtag so that you can track that conversation. Yeah. And then you can say, look, our objective was to deepen relationships, was to transform uh, perspectives and perceptions of what we do as a business. We can look at this hashtag, we can look at the conversations. If 90% of the conversations are going, this company sucks, this is a terrible experience, then you know it hasn't worked. If they're going, had a fantastic transformational experience, met some fascinating people, heard some great content, here's <coughs> some content and, and snippets and quotes being shared, then you know you've got proof that it's delivering on those objectives. It's just not as easy as going, we had this many people in a room, therefore that netted this many sales. That The world isn't as transactional as that now, particularly when dealing with brand perception. I noticed that we're coming just past half past ten, so I think we've got to, to finish. Are there any questions from anybody else at all about anything we've talked about? Yes. Yeah. Just, just on, on your point, Gareth. I think it's not just as, it's not as black and white as, as sort of yeah attendees at event, how many sales. I think also the life cycle of the event, like you said, with social media, what's your content plan pre-event, mm -hmm. what's the content during event, and what's your content plan after the event? Because yeah. you want people talking about it, you want people sharing about it. I mean, our sort of our, our biggest uh, sort of potentially depending on the event, obviously depending on the industry, but uh, you know th our audience are sort of potentially our biggest sales force because if they're sharing and they're sharing and they're sharing, I mean yeah. that's. And that's very measurable. Yeah. Um, and I, I think looking for advocacy is is the key. That's that's your kind of main objective. I shared a little anecdote with, with the guys earlier. Years ago, we worked on um, a launch for a wine brand. And one of the things we wanted to do was measure the audience's affinity for this new wine that they just tasted. And we created um, 10 recycling bins for people to put their little cups in so that everything could all be sustainably recycled and so on. But they were rated 1 to 10. And we said, when you get rid of your cup that you've sampled the wine, simply put the cup in the corresponding bin to say how likely you would recommend this wine to a friend. So what we were able to do was not interrupt the experience that they were having with the brand or the sampling, but we were able to track some very clear numbers because, thankfully, the 9s and 10s were absolutely overflowing and the zeros and ones had a couple in, and in the middle there was next to nothing. So we were actually able to work, scientifically, we were able to work out the net promoter score, but by using a device that people didn't feel like they were being interrupted and asked a question, they were doing, I stretch the use of the word fun here, but it was something <laughs> a little bit lighthearted. It was something easy to do without even thinking, but it got us an interesting statistic at the end of it that people would very keenly recommend the wine brand because they'd had a good experience and we did it without having to directly ask them to vote on it. Thank you. I want some wine now. <laughs> wine? <laughs> I did say it was half past ten. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is there anything else from anybody else? Any other questions or something we might have missed? Or Thank you. Yes, you can. Yes, I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.